On today's show, we deep dive into smart toothbrushes and whether or not they are really necessary, racing drones with the power of your mind, and a plant sphere that will probably kill us all. Then special guest TJ Fixman stops by to tell us about writing for video games and movies. It's fun. We also have a very special package about drone racing. The Drone Racing League is here. It is really cool, and producer Logan got to check it out, so you do not want to miss that. Don't miss it. Tomorrow Daily. <music> Greetings, citizens of the internet. Welcome to Tomorrow Daily, the best geek talk show in the known universe. I'm Ashley Scobie. And I'm Jeff Kanata. Oh my gosh. It's my what favorite part of the week. It's my favorite part of the week. We get I to know. deep dive. I wish we could do an hour every day, but it would be really hard to book guests, you guys. We, Genghis would have to be our guest three out of four days of the week, <laughs> and he is not very talkative, so I don't think that would work out. But we got a lot to cover yeah. this episode. We've got a lot of really cool stuff. Definitely 100% stick around for all the things we have in store. Let's hit the headlines. <laughs> <laughs> Break it down, Ashley. Let's discuss gunplay. Because... Gunplay. Uh, turning your mouth into a playground. Isn't that, is that not what they call themselves? That like, should be the tagline. If it's not, they can, you guys oh, can have that Oh, look how much fun free. this guy's having. Look, he's smiling. He's brushing his teeth. He's is playing that, an instrument. Is that the weirdest way to hold a toothbrush? I mean, I seen? have never <laughs> seen anybody hold a toothbrush like that, but okay. Uh, so this is an attachment, a smart attachment, an Internet of Things attachment that you stick onto the end of a toothbrush. Any toothbrush that'll fit the attachment it looks pretty standard. There it is right yeah. there. So easy. Um, and then you sync it up to an app, and the app has three... Different things on it. Mouth, mouth band, band mouth, mouth news, news, mouth monster. Yeah, yeah. So mouth band, you play a little musical instrument, like kind of cool. He's like, oh, yeah, I'm going to play the yeah, drums. And then it's like, having. as you're brushing, yeah, he really is not. He doesn't even look like he's pushing down that hard. Uh, and then there's mouth news where it's like three minutes of customized news. And then there is uh, mouth monster, which is one where you like fight against your cavities and your plaque yeah. and all that stuff. Um, the question here is, and this was... You guys had a lot to say about this. Honestly, I think some most the maybe the most feedback we've ever gotten about a story <laughs> in a long time. It's 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 a lot. People this is, using that hashtag that Hey TD. Yes. Uh, what are, what are some of the comments? Well, that we we, got? we asked the question in the episode on Monday. Does everything need to be smart? Yeah. And wow, you guys are really adamant about your answers. Arsene wrote, I am too adamant about my answer. Me, but me too, yeah, we're gonna get into that. Jeff might actually go on a rant, so stick around. <laughs> Arsene wrote in and said, smart toothbrush seems like it'll target children users and parents, it'll make daily brushing fun for the children. Um, okay. I don't disagree with that, I don't disagree. I think any way you can get kids to actually sit there and brush their teeth, good thing. Uh, Derek wrote in and said, I wanna play Star Wars Dental Front. Shooting, there you go. Shooting up evil Imperial plaque troopers and facing down Darth the Dentist, Dark Lord of the Drill. That plaque's too powerful for blasters. It's true. Um, I like John's answer. He said, gunplay could be a great way to get my four year old to brush. See similar idea on America's Grace Makers. Use the floss, Luke. <laughs> Come on. I'll laugh at that, I'll give you that one. That was good. <laughs> Uh, Gavin wrote in and said, not everything should be smart. Who will want smart toilet paper? Nobody. I, I want my toilet paper to be as dumb as possible. Yeah, I think so. And then uh, Bedjam wrote in and said, I definitely don't think everything should be smart. There's something about using your own brain that just makes you feel human. And I thought that was interesting. Not not makes you feel right, makes you feel human. Like, I really mm. like that choice of words. So good point there. So the idea here is that we are not willing to brush our teeth unless there's some sort of game or entertainment Or gamifying happening. it. Gamify, yeah. gam gamification is like a big thing. There's yeah. like the R life RPG. Right. Where you can do your whole, all your habits and, and I stuff. get that. I like games. I'm a big fan of games. I like gamifying stuff and turning things into games. But by the way, could they not get a single person that knows how to hold a toothbrush in these Well, maybe commercials? that's how they hold their toothbrush in Japan. Maybe that's maybe how they so. teach you. I don't culture, know. Is, it, is it might be a cultural thing. Is a cultural divide? Guys, send in your photography and show us how you hold your toothbrush. Uh, this month's theme, brushing your teeth. <laughs> we're going to change it right now. No, we're not. It's uh, still are spring. you in favor of this, Ashley? Are you, are you, are you pro toothbrush games? Okay. <laughs> I'm going to say this. I am pro toothbrush games because I think people don't realize how long you have to brush your teeth for. Like... If you actually sit down and put a timer on like brushing your teeth and you haven't right. ever timed it, you're probably not brushing for as long as you need to. It's true. Um, but, but, 
I, I have a real problem with wanting to connect everything because it's so clanky. Like it's, if you're gonna do yeah. it, I mean, I know that we have to go through all this awkward phase of internet of things, not all communicating with each other, but it's like, if you're gonna do it, it needs, I, I don't know. I, I do like that it's sort of an attachment. So it's like, if you right. don't wanna use it, then you just take it off, it's fine. But I say no, like I don't, don't make everything smart. Like, because then it'll just make us dumb. Like, yeah, I don't want to do that. Don't make us dumber. It's because if you enable people to not take care of themselves, like if they rely on a machine to take care of themselves, like it's just, that is a slippery slope. It ends badly, I think. Yeah, can I have, I have like two minutes of my life where I'm just doing the one thing? I don't have to be multitasking on That's the a, Yeah, exactly. It's like, man, yeah. I just like, listen, I get it. Like, sometimes I like to, you know, read while I'm eating or so, like, but just focus. I don't know. I mean, I like the idea of motivating kids to brush their teeth longer. Sure. But who doesn't? Uh, you know what else motivates kids to brush their teeth longer? Brush your teeth longer. <laughs> beatings. <laughs> beatings. The beatings will continue until, mor Tasers. until morale improves. Uh, yeah. I mean, I'm just there's certain things about self discipline that have to you know like not, right. Not, that you, we need just, to like, teach people. It. Right. Exactly. There's there is a self discipline aspect here that is very important and i think that not everything's a, fun yeah not life is hard this is the most important thing we're going to teach you on tomorrow daily is that life is not always fun sometimes life is hard i mean listen we get to have fun here 45 minutes but and a then lot the of, rest of our lives are terrible but a lot of work and hard hard work that is not necessarily like fun in a traditional sense goes into making this part of the we show we have 45 minutes of doing the show literally every other minute of our lives is just brushing our teeth yeah. that's all we do it's just you think garbage. it's easy to get get on camera and not have brushed your teeth for 17 straight hours it's that's true. all we do every it's person you've really ever rough. seen on on television brushes their teeth the majority of their day all the time um but yeah i mean i think that's that's what that's all i can say to you yeah. guys that's all i can say to you is I don't know. sometimes life isn't fun, and you have to learn that through things like brushing your teeth and being bored out of your skull. I'm also, sorry. Um, to tomorrow, uh, tonight, when I brush my teeth, I'm gonna try hold the, it very try beautifully. The, the it does look Japanese very delicate. Method. It does look very delicate. Okay, really quickly, let's touch on racing uh, drones with your mind. I was not here. I was mm -hmm. filming Tabletop. That's right. I'm see, excited I'm gonna, to see that episode. I'm, gonna, I'm a guest on Tabletop season four. Very excited about that. Yeah. Um, played Code Names. It was very exciting. Great game. Uh, but you got to you got to talk about this, which is really cool. Um, this is a whole bunch of students that were able to race drones with the power of their mind, with their brain waves. Yeah. So how cool is that? Amazing. They focus on making it go forward, and it goes forward. And uh, yeah, okay. So they're looking at this little object on a screen. Yep. And then the, basically, it's like, okay, focus on making the object go forward, and then they sort of animate it moving forward as you're thinking about it, and the software recognizes what parts of your brain are firing while you're thinking of that idea and mm -hmm. that's how it, they use it to control the drones. Yeah. That's and this so is bad. all these kids are this is Ender's game. All these kids are then they didn't realize they were actually fighting in the real intergalactic war. Oh no. Yeah. I, spo I just spoiled Ender's game for everyone by the way. I know. But that's hey, okay. Spoiler alert, 30 year old spoiler alert. <laughs> um yeah, no, I thought this was really cool that they're developing this. Um I know that there were a couple of people who just briefly like looked at the headline and was like, "Well, that's dumb. Like racing drones with your brain seems really stupid, but the goal is, and this is the important part, if they can get people to be able to control things like drones mm -hmm. with their brainwaves, they can also get people to control things like prosthetics. Toothbrushes. Toothbrushes. Wheelchairs. Robots yeah. holding toothbrushes to brush your teeth with. <laughs> yeah, no, that w it actually could be a very powerful tool for people with disabilities, which mm -hmm. I think th all this sort of expanding it out, getting large data sets, getting people, yeah. lots of different people to wear these things and try them out. Now, this... It's funny how this relates to the first story that we talked about because this is a way to use fun as a method to sort of gather large data samples, get people to do a thing. You know, sitting there and concentrating on a thing on a screen right. is not fun, but if you make it fun, yeah. now all of a sudden you're incentivized so to do it. So maybe we're and... backtracking a little bit on not everything should be fun because this actually seems like it should be fun it's at all first. About toothbrushes it is all the it really is we're all we just all drone to brush drone toothbrushing it really does um <laughs> i like that we're tying this all together <laughs> and becoming hypocrites in the process uh so our last story that we wanted to talk about is um is sort of ecology in urban areas yeah this through is cool. hortum machina b which i think is tight. amazing <laughs> thank you um these are this is a bunch of architecture students and they 
basically created this uh, it's kind of a cybernetic. It's a plant ball. Geodesic sphere, which if you, it looks like, it looks like playground equipment, which it is. Yeah. I mean, it's geodesic. You see those at playgrounds. Um, and then inside it has these panels that have plants on them. And then, yeah, you can see it all expands and stuff. And then it's like the plants can go to the edge or it mm -hmm. can, it can, it can retract all the way in. Um, and so it can move. It's got actuators in it that change. That doesn't, it's gonna, not going to scare anybody. I mean, it sort of reminds me of, for some reason, as I was watching this, did you ever see the movie Rubber, the tire that kills people? No, but You've I want never you seen Rubber? No. What? Okay. The tire that kills people. There's a this great. This terrifying. <laughs> if I saw a giant ball of plant r roaming around on its own. This is what this needs, okay? It needs a microphone and a speaker inside it to where the person controlling it can be like, hey, what's up, man? Yeah. Or like, feed me, Seymour. Yeah, yeah, exactly. I mean, I would love it. If it played music, like beautiful, relaxing music as it ro rolled around town, that's I, what I want to I see. actually think this is a really cool concept and an, an idea of cr making making plants, ta taking the idea of technology and organics and kind of fusing them together into something really new. I think yeah. it's cool. The end result is, is a little terrifying and weird. Well, it's really big. Very so big. I think that that's a thing. But I like the idea of uh, nature moving around in the city just like people. Like do you? That, that sort of concept. <laughs> yeah, because the thing is, is I, I okay, I don't know if, if I do. If I'm in a city, usually there's like some gardens that you could go see or like there are places you could go to see plant life or ecology or something green to relax, to right. remind you of being in the outdoors. But I like this because at any given moment in your day, you could be pleasantly surprised <laughs> by... crushed by a rolling... Garden. No, you'll go right through it because there's holes in oh, it. Oh, good. So it'll roll right on you, just like, and then it'll just keep going. You'll just have like leaves in your hair, yeah, and you're like, fine. "Whoa, what just I was, happened?" I was just ambushed Oof. in a wonderful way by a plant, and now you know I'm what just... that is? It's, it's katamari damasi. It is. It's like a cat. It's like a plant katamari. Yeah, I love it. I love it. Um, Firas wrote in, use hash, hashtag #HeyTD and said, "Not sure who's gonna take over humans first: robots or giant plant balls." Man, I don't trust the giant plant balls. I'm yeah, sorry. I don't know. I don't. I don't know either. First, they come for our toothbrushes. It's true. Then they come for our brain-powered drones. Then they come, then they come for everyone. And they just <laughs> and crush they, us all. They were just all like inside the plants, you know. No, just, we become the plants. That's yeah. the end of the Twilight Zone episode. We're gonna write. You I think, are the plant ball. I, I think we just wrote an episode of the Twilight Zone. We did. I'm pretty the sure. The episode we just is wrote. called Balls of Plants. Plant balls. Plant balls. We are not good at titles. <laughs> really bad at titles. We should not. Oh, boy. Maybe somebody can think of a good title. That would be great. Um, by the way, breaking news: Alicia Vikander is going to play Lara Croft. Oh, in in a new new Tomb movie? Raider. Yep. Movie or TV Alicia show? Alicia Vikander. I think Tomb it should Raider. be a TV show. I agree with that, but I mean, they like the movies, and it's a really big franchise. So it's a really big reboot. franchise, but it feels so much. It, it, I love the idea of like episodic adventures that Lara would yeah, be going on. I agree. I, I did. I'm kind of shocked. I thought Daisy Ridley was a lock for it. So Alicia yeah. Vikander. She was in uh, Alicia Vikander's Ex Machina, right? She played uh, Oh, wow. Eva. Eva? She, yeah, Eve. Eva, Eva. Eva. I was like, Eva. That sounds Ooh, wrong. Wow. Yeah, that one. Yeah. Um, yeah, great stuff. So uh, that is it for our headlines. We will be, there's a tweet that I was looking for that I, he, he didn't tag it, Hey TV, and oh, he tweeted well, at both of us, and I said, I'm going to save this for Thursday's show, no. and I'm so sorry. Let that be a lesson to you. Person who, I promised your tweet would be on the show. I don't know where it is. I couldn't find if it. there's no Hey TV ta hashtag, you may as well have just been rolled up in a plant ball and rolled down the street, because we're rolled, not going to find it again. And rolled off the edge of the earth, because we're it's, not gonna find it again. Cause it's flat. Yeah, exactly. Um, so that is, uh, that is headlines. I really enjoyed that. That was great. As did I. I really had fun. Uh, we will be right back. We have TJ Fixman oh, who's so going to come in, and he has written Ratchet and Clank games. He's writing the new Popeye movie. He's got a whole bunch of stuff going on, guys. A whole bunch of stuff. Stick around. And he's going to talk to you about writing video games and movies. So, yes, as Jeff says, stick around. <laughs> Welcome back to the show. Our guest today is a real life paid Hollywood writer, not just some rando in a coffee shop working on his magnum opus. Uh, you might know him from such games as Ratchet and Clink. And he's also a creative consultant for Hasbro. We are excited to welcome TJ Fixman. Thanks Woo! for being here, man. Thanks for having me. So yeah. good. Um, so, okay. A lot of people out there, first of all, love uh, video games. 
many, many right. people love video games. Uh, love Ratchet and Clank, and you, you've written Ratchet and Clank games. How many of them? Oh God, yeah, you, you know, I have to go to IMDb to be sure, but I think it's either seven or nine. It's, it's up there. It's up there. How yeah, great is it that Ratchet and Clank is back at the top of the charts oh. again with an amazing installment? I mean, oh. I think people that are playing it's this really game good. weren't even alive when the first one came out. I think know? so. I mean, there, I think the first one came out in 2002. So yeah, yeah. I mean, this is, and this one is a sort of. Uh, reimagining of that first game, so it's very cool. And to it's see. phenomenal. I mean, yeah, I am loving it. I just right. got my jetpack. Yeah. Oh, nice! Is that my jetpack on Gaspar? Um, so and I, they have a film, and there's a film. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Ratchet and Clank are, are big and back and ready it's, to rock. This weekend, the movie comes out. Um, but I want to. A lot of people really wonder what it takes to be a video game writer because mm -hmm. I think that's sort of a job that like has a lot of mystery surrounding right, yeah, it. Yeah. Because at, uh, in early days of gaming, there was just sort of like. Well, let's just have our producers kind of come up with something. We'll have some, or co you know, our programmers come up with something. We'll just have sort of a basic thing, and then you ended up with, you know, the end of Ghosts and Goblins, where, <laughs> where it's just, or you no know, no one got to the end of Ghosts and Goblins. That's true. <laughs> Nobody ever did that. Um, but and now we are seeing very much so uh, in the last, you know, ten or fifteen years of video games, we've seen really uh, screenwriters, people who are actually invested in story structure, uh, formatting, you know, things like that, coming into gaming. You got into video game writing kind of in a really weird way, and yeah. it's. One of my favorite stories of starting in that industry, and I like. Can you tell our, our viewers because I think they'll enjoy it as much as I did. Yeah, sure. I mean, I came out to uh, I came out to Los Angeles with a degree in computer animation and hopes of writing, and and the the degree in computer animation was very much my, my safety fallback because I knew the odds of becoming a working the writer. Plan B. Are, are, yeah, exactly, exactly. They're astronomical. So I ended up um, out here simultaneously like writing and trying to develop like a 3D animated show by myself, one person in the room, which wow. is, which is well, I say that because it's impossible. That's a lot <laughs> of work, yeah. Not, I'm not saying, well, look at me, wow. I'm saying it's impossible to do. So I, like, after like two years, I'd gotten almost nothing done. And I was, um, I was working at Insomniac Games as a uh, QA tester. And this was on back in the Resistance Fall of Man days, back when the PS3 had just come out. And uh, my contract was wrapping up. I had sort of finished the game, and I was ready to leave. And um, I didn't have any job lined up afterwards. I, I'd, you know, I had an agent. I'd been taking meetings. I've been trying to get my scripts up, but like nothing was hitting. So like I was looking at my bank account. I had two hundred and fifty dollars left in my bank account. I had no backup plan. I think a lot of people don't realize, as a QA tester, that in gaming, like you don't stay at the company. Usually, when you're done testing right. that particular game, like you're on a contract, and when that game is done being exactly. tested, you are also done. <laughs> yeah, it's a contract job. You know that yeah. going in, and so, yeah. so like, so like, I, I, I finished the game, and it was very much time to say, okay, you know, so long, and thanks for all the fish, and sure, and I'm, and I'm at, and I was, uh, I was packing up my, my desk. And I, did, I was unaware at the time, but the writer that was on Ratchet and Clank Tools Destruction at the time, for whatever reason, it wasn't working out between him and Insomniac, so they were going to part ways. But he had somehow read some of my scripts. And like we'd, we'd talked in the halls before, but I didn't show him anything. I guess just the scripts started to get around in this town. Oh, wow. And he's like, I'm sorry that I didn't work out, but actually I read that guy's stuff, and it, it's really good. You these should are actually... like film spec scripts you'd written. These are, yeah, these yeah. are spec scripts that I'd written. And apparently he'd, he'd read some of them, and he, he recommended me. So as I'm packing up my stuff, the HR director came up to me and asked if I would come back on Monday, an interview for the job as a writer. Wow. Uh, so I spent that entire weekend unemployed, you know, $250 on my bank account, like talking to my parents about how I'm going to be able to basically have to move home and figure out my next oh. move back to New Jersey. And, wow. Like, I couldn't even afford the move, so I wasn't even sure how I was going to do it. How to get back, it. yeah. Uh, and Monday I came and interviewed for it, and they gave me the job, and I think I started like on Wednesday. So that was. That's the, incredible. And yeah. you've been a, a working writer ever since? Yes, ever since. I'm not going to say that, but yes, 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 ever since. Amazing. Uh, and I, I, yeah, and I, and I stayed in Sunday for a good long time. I think it was like seven or eight years. And then I moved on in 2013, and now I've been sort of contract mostly doing feature work, but doing, of course, the Hasbro stuff as well. So yeah. what is the difference between writing for interactive entertainment as opposed to writing for films and TV? I mean, it's 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 a totally different uh, ball of wax, and it's super interesting. I always tell like writers who are coming in, like, if you ever want to sort of see what you're made of, like, boot camp is... Like, video game writing is boot camp, essentially. Wow. Because imagine hiring everybody at once, the director, the actors, the production team, without a script ready and just saying, everybody go. <laughs> right, you know, so start making ready, something. Ready, set, go. Start writing, will catch up. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So yeah. you're laying down the, the tracks, basically, as the train is coming oh, through. Wow. wow. So it teaches you to be agile. It teaches you not to be too precious, which is a big, like, it's tough for a lot of writers to get used to the idea that they don't just submit a script and it's just made. Right. You know, yeah. like scripts right. are never finished. Uh, but I think it's more it's it's more so in video games where nothing like you can write the perfect third act twist. This is the example I always use. You can write the perfect third act twist and the designer can come up to you and be like, 
but I'm so sorry, we just cut that level. Yeah. Uh, can you just make it work? I'm like, yeah, sure, I'll just write another scene. No, 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 we, we don't have any more, any more time for scenes. Just make it work. Just find some way of sort of tying it together. Uh, now, my question to you yeah. about that, because as a player, you, you feel that, right? Sure. And I, I wonder if you feel like games need to get to a place where that is more valued. Like the narrative experience is more valued sure. and and there's a, a shifting of priority as, as far as to how video games are made. Right, to right. say, like, this is a great script, let's make it into a game. Yeah. Like, this is a great game script, or great, you know, sort of synopsis or sure. logline for a game. Like, let's make that. I think, I think there are, I think nowadays there are studios that are getting more and more story conscious. Like, if you look at Irrational with, like, Ken Levine and what he did with Bioshock, if you look at what Amy Hennig did with the Uncharted series, there are more and more studios who are adopting that philosophy. Yeah. But production is always against us. Like, there's always going to be something. And this happens in features, right. too, and to a small degree. Except that it starts with this is the story that we yeah. want to starts tell. with the script. Um, yeah. But like with with video games, it's always going to start with the tech. So if a video game studio finds that they can do zero G really well, well, guess what kind of game you're writing? You're writing yeah. a space game. It doesn't yeah. matter if you have a great zombie game sort of locked right. and loaded. That's so like, interesting to me. That it's like, well, we have this really great. We developed this really great technology. Like yeah. let's craft a game around it. Yeah, and sure. it's like like or you said, mechanic. if it's a mechanic, yeah. something yeah. that we've developed, and it's like, man, we have to use this in a game. Like. Let's make that work. Well, like, look, so interesting. Look at Portal. Though. Like, like Portal is the best example of that. Portal had one mechanic, right? Which is this, and it was an amazing mechanic. And right? built a tremendous. But they built this amazing yeah. story around yeah. it, where it was like all set in one location with like one, you know, like one antagonist evil antagonist, yeah. And it was amazing. So I feel so like, you know, it sounds when you, when you lay it out, it doesn't sound like the ideal way to work, but it, it's very much the way that that the entire industry operates into a smaller degree features and. You just learn to, to deal with it, and, and it, that's what you mm. need to learn as a writer, regardless of whether or not you go into video games or movies. Whatever, you have to learn not to be precious. Well, it right. seems like as your work with Hasbro is probably from the same vein because you start with a an IP, right? You start with a concept, yeah. and you have to build a world around that. Exactly, and that's the thing that I, that I love doing the most. Like, I, like when people ask me if, I, if I'm a writer, I always sort of say yes, I'm a writer, but I'm also a world builder because. There, there's something fun about not just building out, building out like a three-act story, but saying, here's how the world works. Here's how the characters interact mm -hmm. with each other. That's really, really fun. So to get to go into Hasbro, who has all these amazing IP like Transformers and G.I. Joe and Micronauts, and, like, and get to sort of play around with that and figure out how it can all connect, like, that's, yeah. that's, that's really cool. I feel, like, I feel kind of like Tom Hanks in Big, but instead of toys, <laughs> it's games. Yeah, it's, uh, you it's get movies, to like, tie you know? them all together. Yeah, yeah, it's cool. And you know, they, they give me lots of toys, which is always a plus, and, you know. It's yeah. Cool. Now you, um, Mr. Zircon is, I think, one of my favorite oh, yeah. evil robots. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, I have many favorite have a evil robots. Exactly. Gladys. <laughs> I've got Gladys. You've got I, a theme. I, got I have it. really All do. Right. I love evil robots. <laughs> HK47. I mean, yes. I just really love them in gaming. And so, Mr. Zircon, also a favorite. Um, but it it can be really difficult. I remember we were talking about this the other day. It's really difficult to continue to come up with these <laughs> yeah. like one liners because oh, yeah. he has to constantly have these you know quips in the game as yeah. you summon him, and it's like they have they can't be too repetitive. Yeah. So over the course of however many seven to nine Ratchet and Clank games, like mm. how many lines of Mr. Zircon would you say you've written? Easily. 500 easily wow. but and probably closer to a thousand I'm just trying to think of like what probably what made it into the game right and the funny thing with like mr. zircon was that like when we first started him he was just like a little bot that would sort of fly around you and he didn't look uh, he didn't look like he did now he looked what, what we call a consumer bot just one of the bots that sort of fly around the levels they did smack with your wrench and I have to give credit to Brian Allgaier for this because Brian Allgaier my creative director was like you know something like we can give personality to this thing so let's give it a name let's call it Mr. Zircon we're going to overhaul its its looks and goes, what would you do with it and I was like what if he just thought everything was stupid what if he would, <laughs> what if he talked in third person and he and he trash talked but it was just in the most like obvious like sort of Chuck Norris style yeah ways. yeah or Mr. So, T like he said oh right. Mr. Zircon yeah. is bored That's exactly or like uh, Mr. Zircon doesn't need nanotech to survive like his uh, <laughs> I, I, Mr. Zircon he, he lives will, on the fear of others or yeah, something like yeah. that yeah Mr. Zircon like, will punch you in the face with bullets like I mean there's, yeah. some, really, there's some real zing yeah, he will give you a concerto of suffering. It's something yeah, like yeah. that when you write it, it looks dumb. And when you record it, you're like, that sounds dumb. But like, somehow when you get in the game, you're like, that's actually... It just works. It works, it's and fun. it's really funny. Yeah. And it became yeah. like this fan favorite ever since. So, so uh, you know, I, I take it as a source of uh, a great pride that it's become this big, you know, uh, uh, weapon in the game. I don't think they would do a Ratchet Clank game without one now. It's kind of like the Groove of China. Like people, yeah. just, people just expect it. They yeah. associate it with the characters, yeah. Yeah, because yeah. that's personality. So you, you came into the industry in such a roundabout way. Uh, yeah. What would you say is your advice to people who, who want to get in? Start in Q&A 
and then just hang around. I just <laughs> get, secretly get, drop yeah. scripts next to the writer's yeah, yeah, cards yeah, exactly. just in hope that <laughs> they pick them up. Empty your bank account. Yeah. yeah, well, I, I, the thing that people uh, do incorrectly is they, 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 they go to school for and get like a degree in game writing and they apply for and they look for game writing jobs. Game writing jobs really aren't advertised online. Maybe that'll right. change and like I've seen a couple pop up here and there but really that like they like game studios will either hire from within or they'll they'll reach out to people who have uh, representation of an agent or have done a lot of samples. Um, but either way, the the trick is to have lots of samples ready to get a, a degree or some sort of experience inside a game studio or a computer animation degree, let's say, or like right. a design degree. Because it, you know, I think one of the reasons why game studios lean in towards producers or people who have uh, game experience or animation experiences because they understand what the other departments are up to. Right, but when they, they understand that process. Yeah, and it's a very complicated like process yeah. with tons of different departments all working, you know, 60, 70 hour weeks to get this gaming. So like, I think when people just sort of get a degree in writing and just expect to go in there and pitch a game idea, well that Mm -hmm. That doesn't do anything for a game studio because game yeah. studios are not in want of like they've got plenty of their ideas right. and you can find people who can write stuff. But what they need is is somebody who understands the different departments. So if you've right. got a design degree, if you have even a, an art degree or an animation degree, you're going to be ahead of where just a, a you know somebody with a writing background is. Like mm -hmm. if I if I was had just been a writer and didn't have the background in uh, in computer animation, I don't think I would have gotten a job because while I was doing Resistance Fall of Man. Uh, they needed somebody who would, who from QA who could handle collision, uh, or who could handle uh, what they call nav meshing, which mm -hmm. is uh, uh, sort of mapping out where enemies can walk. I think they've got programmers that, could, that can do this automatically now. But back in the day, yeah. you had to have somebody yeah. sit in an office until like four in the morning. Make actually, it work. Yeah. yeah. So like, I think while I was doing that, I was sort of proving to the people who I worked with, like, okay, like he's not just a writer, but he also understands. He gets of, it. Yeah. yeah, he understands what the other departments are up against. So you're not sure. just sort of coming down from your ivory tower saying, here is my script. Yeah. Right. Make yeah. it so. Well, and know? also, like, there's an understanding of, like, when you're, as you're writing, you can think of, you can keep other departments in consideration yes. where you say, like, if I'm writing something, like, how are they ever going to program this? Yeah. Like, this is not realistic. You can actually mm -hmm. edit that down in a way that a writer not experienced in the games industry would not be able to do. Absolutely. And I just think it's animation as well because there's, there's, there's things that like I'm dealing with like on Popeye now because I'm running Popeye for Sony Animation where if you know what's an intensive animation scene and what's not, you, the production team will love you for it. Like right. I know that I can't write all crowd scenes because right. crowd right. scenes, big effects scenes. Really it's really tough. It's tough. It's expensive. It's time intensive, and it pisses animators off. And then they yeah. come for you with the, with the, with the torches. Lots of one on ones in Popeye. <laughs> exactly. And that's the thing. If you could write and just say, "Hey, reaction shot," while something happens off off camera, it's like people will see like, okay, like you understand that. It can't just flow from your head. Yeah, and, it's being and, considerate. And, you're being considerate yeah. of the people you work with in a in a narrative way, which I think a lot right. of people don't really, a lot of people don't grab onto that as much as I think they, like you see things right. where people go, well, why didn't they just write a scene like this? Yeah. Like, you know, you see all these like armchair Chances quarterbacks. Are we wanted to. <laughs> yeah, and it's like they see armchair quarterbacks online. They go, well, they should have written this scene. And it's yeah. like, well, you have to consider all of the different departments that would have had to have contributed to that scene. And how expensive it would have been, and uh, how, and is that part of the budget, and is it this? And it's like there's usually a good reason for why something didn't exist. Oh yeah, I mean, like, we we live with these games for you know, anywhere between one years and, and three years. So we, we every we've had many many meetings about every single possible iteration of, of a scene that can possibly be. Sure. But you know, like I remember seeing one comment where someone's like, "Why aren't like you know Ratchet and Clank sequences more like uh, uh, Final Fantasy?" I'm like. Final Fantasy will have a 500 person team <laughs> yeah, exactly. 10 right, years yeah, yeah. to make a game yeah, where yeah. like everything that was done at Insomniac was done in house which right. is which is incredible very rare yeah. Yeah. you know I, like so it, it, it yes like there are certain things that we, that we want to do but it's always about picking your battles and saying okay like what is this story really about is is there something that we're putting in just for the sake of flash or is there something that that we think we're saying really matters scene. yeah yeah exactly that's awesome man well, that's, I'm, that's I'm excited for a, a a Popeye movie I'll tell you that I am too Popeye's great I mean I haven't seen it's ever since the Robin Williams one I've been like when are they gonna when am I gonna get an animated Popeye this one this one's fun yeah I'm, I'm excited about that well yeah. uh we'll wrap things up we'll let you go I'm sure you you are a very busy man You're I've been big, trying yeah. to get you on this show for like two months and you're like <laughs> I have so many meetings I'm sorry I'm so busy I can't yeah. We appreciate um, but it. But we're really excited. Uh, you can check out Ratchet and Clank the movie. It drops in theaters this weekend, which uh, which is cool. You wrote the first draft for that. Um, and uh, and then also uh, you can, of course, check out Ratchet and Clank the game, which uh, Jeff and I have been greatly enjoying. It's really, really fantastic. fun. And if you've never met Mr. Zircon, well, just let me tell you, you're in for <laughs> a treat. Um, and, uh, and then you can follow TJ on Twitter. Right? Sorry, just at TJ Fixman. Yeah. At TJ Fixman. Um, and uh, thank you so much for coming yeah, on the show. Really appreciate yeah. it. Uh, we'll be right back with an amazing 
package about drone racing that producer Logan put together, so stick around. It's Tomorrow Daily. Welcome back, friends. Hey, that TJ fellow is pretty fun. What a delight. Yeah. He's like a big old bowl of ice cream. It's like so <laughs> great. Um, so we had the enormous pleasure and honor of attending drone racing. Oh, I'm so jealous. I didn't I get to go to this. You were out of town for yeah. this. Um, Logan and I went to the drone racing league's second, uh, I believe it was a third qualifying match, a race in Los Angeles called LA Apocalypse. Um, and producer Logan put together this just spectacular so piece. So take a second and watch the drone racing piece, piece that he did. FPV drone racing is already a huge hit amongst RC hobbyists, and as the sport continues to grow in popularity, so do pro circuits. The Drone Racing League, or DRL, is trying to take the sport to the next level with awesome looking racetrack designs, innovative tech, and some of the coolest broadcast equipment we've ever seen. This is DRL's first official season, and we got to go to their second qualifying event, Level 2 LA Apocalypse, set in a real abandoned shopping mall near Los Angeles. DRL CEO and founder Nicholas Horbacheski gave us a walking tour of the enormous post-apocalyptic track. This is a very cool setting for a drone race because it allows us to use the full three-dimensional elements of racing. So the drones go up, they go down, they come around. And those drones aren't just flying up, down, and through simple hoops. DRL worked with Hollywood special effects company Legacy Effects to create a one-of-a-kind environment. Their experience working on films like Jurassic World, Iron Man, and Pacific Rim really shows in this elaborate course design. Not only does DRL have to consider how pilots from all over the world will fly through the track, but also how spectators will be able to see the drones, which travel up to 80 miles an hour at times. To do this, they borrow a cable system called the Batcam, which follows along and even gets ahead of the action. So the Batcam is a cable cam that runs over the length of the course. It can go 100 miles an hour. You know, you got a 100 mile an hour camera chasing an 80 mile an hour drone. So it's, a, it's pretty exciting when they're both going full speed. Since racers require a constant video signal from the drone's FPV camera to see where their quadcopter is going at all times, DRL had to create a lot of the tech they use. The Drone Racing League has designed and built our own radio frequency equipment from the ground up. And it allows us to put on race courses on a scale uh, that's never been seen before. Each drone is also built from the ground up by DRL. This is our second model drone. It's called the Racer 2. It's all carbon fiber and it's designed for speed and maneuverability, but also for visibility for the audience. You'll see it's covered in these LED lights that when they're on are brightly lit and each in a different color. So you know which pilot is flying which drone. DRL provides its own drones for pilots. Because of that, racers can push the limits of their quadcopter and compete on true pilot skill as opposed to technical enhancements. We're always taking chances. We want to go as fast as we can and uh, you know, get that adrenaline rush. That's what we need to do. So uh, that's what we live for as pilots. We often say to the pilots, if you're not crashing, you're not racing hard enough. Watching drone races feels like you're in a science fiction film. And if a race comes to your area, get a ticket. You won't be disappointed. I wish that I'd been part of that. I really, we didn't know, when you guys got invited to this, we were all like, is this thing gonna be lame? Yeah. But that looks awesome. The way, the broadcast cameras, I mean, they really are gunning for a super high quality experience, and I think that they've achieved it. I, I can't wait for the day where they're, Unfortunately, because of laws that dictate, you Stupid know, drone laws. flying and stuff, they have to be indoors. Yeah. So I think that there's got to be the one thing I wish they had. That's kind of cool. Like I love that it's indoors. I agree. I, we loved the abandoned mall, and it's a real abandoned mall. It was amazing. We have to walk around in it. Um, I think that the one thing they really need, and because they do have the glasses that you yeah. can sort of check out, and then you put them on, and you can watch from the drone's point of view. Yeah. Which is really cool. But I think they need some kind of like jumbotron or a big screen to sort of like switch. Uh, we need somebody live switching those qualifying matches to get the crowds really pumped about it, um, and not so much, uh, you know, because they're kind of watching and then it's like you you can kind of see some stuff going on. They do have a screen, but it's like it's not the same. I kind of want this to take off and become a, a bigger thing. I think people yeah. would. I, I super skeptical when I first heard about it, but. It, it really looks like a fun spectator sport. It's way more exciting than I thought, too. We got there, and I was just super 
I was really shocked at how excited I was yeah. and how much I was into watching the drones race. Really brilliant of uh, DRL to put uh, special LED lights of every color for each pilot. Yeah, for sure. It's yeah. really, really cool. So thank you to the uh, Drone Racing League for letting us go do that. I, we really appreciate it, and we can't wait to check out what the finals are. Uh, before that, I think they did their first qualifier was inside an abandoned nuclear plant. Oh, my gosh. In New, I think upstate New York, they had said, right. and then there was one in Miami. Um, that was very like slick and futuristic and colorful and stuff. Hmm. And then they did LA Apocalypse. They're, they'll have, I believe they said six races this year. So um, if very they neat. end up coming to a town near you, you should definitely check out what they have going on. Uh, so that is uh, just about it for the show. Do you want to talk about Into It though? Let's do it. All right. Jeff, what are you into? I'm into a movie this week. I mean, we are on the precipice ladies and gentlemen, of the summer blockbuster season. Yes. Uh, Civil War looms as the official kickoff. I would call that the official kickoff of the summer blockbuster season. I think season. so. I think so. But before you get excited about that, and you should be excited about that, there is a small movie that I think you should watch. Now, this is a very rated R, very violent, very intense movie. But if you are a person that likes those kinds of things, I cannot recommend Green Room higher this is from the same director that did Blue Ruin. Mm. Uh, this is, if I told you, Ashley, what if Quentin Tarantino got to write a Die Hard movie? Would oh. you be excited about that? I'd be into that. This is kind of like that. Basically, it's the idea of these, these kids that are part of this punk band, and they get a gig at a uh, neo-Nazi club, like this underground neo-Nazi club. And then things go real bad, real fast, and they're kind of as they tend to do at neo-Nazi clubs. Yes, I think and they're kind of trapped happening. there. And it's like, what do they do? How do they get out? What's going to happen to them? It is absolutely. Yeah, Patrick Stewart is in it. He plays a neo-Nazi. You've never seen Patrick Stewart Picard. play a villain like this. No. Uh, it is one of the most intense, one of the most thrilling, one of the coolest movies I've seen all year. I'm certain it will be in my top ten at the end of the year. It is that good. Wow. I was on the edge of my seat exclaiming uh, at some of the things that would happen. The violence comes out of nowhere. It is intense and awesome. And the coolest thing about this movie and uh, the, my favorite thing about movies that are kind of like Die Hard is the characters are smart. They yeah. handle things in a very smart way. And you love that. When you feel like you're in this situation with these characters, you're like, oh my gosh, what would I do there? And then they do I that. I always want to feel like, oh, that was a really smart thing that they did. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I always great, like that too. Great, great movie. Wow. I'm getting sort of uh, Walter White vibes off of like... Uh, Patrick Stewart in yeah, it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. He's, I'm kind of he getting Heisenberg. I wouldn't this. say Walter White. I'd say Heisenberg. Like later seasons, again, like yeah. Heisenberg vibes off of Patrick Stewart in this. So yeah, that looks really good. It's awesome. Uh, I am going to do a video game this week. Oh, tell um, me more. So as as we all know, I love indie video games, love small uh, video games. Little anecdote before I tell you what game it is, but uh, when I got my PlayStation Four, it mm -hmm. was at launch, and um, and there wasn't a whole lot of launch titles I was super interested in. Yeah. But there was one game on PlayStation Four, uh, PlayStation Plus that was free, and it was Rezo Gun. Oh, great game. And um, and my PlayStation Four was legitimately a Rezo Gun machine for yeah. about four months. Uh, Housemark, the developer who made Resogun, made the game I'm into this week. It's called Alienation. Mm. Um, I don't know if you've seen anything I about have, this. I have, yes. Uh, I just got a review code last night. I asked, I begged, I was like, please, just give me a review code. I didn't even, I was like, oh, I'm begging you, please. Um, it kind of reminds me of Diablo. Mm -hmm. Kind of reminds me of Helldivers. Right. In that sort of, it's a dual stick shooter. It's kind of like that three quarters top down look to it. But it's so colorful. Uh, which is unlike a lot of the top-down shooters we've seen, like Helldivers, very desaturated. Yeah, um, it was neon. Diablo, Look at desaturated. That. This is full color craziness. I mean, unbelievable action going on. You can play with your friends. It's online co-op. You can do all the things. Um, I I just dug into it last night, but I'm really really into it right now. I can't wait to play more. Um, I will be I'll be splitting my time between that and a certain major AAA game that yeah, will well, be dropping on May 10th. That, that shall we, not be we named. Can't be talking about yet, but yes. That might rhyme with like. Blunt blarded. Yeah, that schmuschmarded. <laughs> but I I'm gonna be splitting my time because this yeah. game looks super fun and I I have been I did the tutorial and and the first area um, last night and I really really liked it and I'm really into it. So House Mark. So far, so good. Really looking forward to playing more and digging deep That's... into uh, Alienation. And it's, I think it's like uh, like 15 or 20 bucks. On very, it. very cool. Those yeah. are some good intuits to keep you 
excited over the weekend. Keep you, back. keep you tied it over until Civil War next weekend, and then you're going to see that over and over and over again. So <laughs> exactly. That's what we're all going to be doing together. Yeah. Um, all right, so as is tradition on Tomorrow Daily, I was a tradition, so weird. Let's talk about our photographer of the day. And this is where we do our regular rituals. We'll get out the our candles hooded, our and hooded cloaks. the uh, so, yeah. mm -hmm. chanting will begin. And now we will talk about our photographer. Our photographer of the day today is Andrew. Our very last of uh, monuments, places oh. of interest, landmarks. Uh, took shot this on his iPhone 6S and said, this is my photo at Capiliano Park in Vancouver, BC. Thank you for having your talk show on CNET. By the way, I took this photo on my iPhone 6S camera. You have permission to use it. Um, he, did, nice. he did all the right things. Um, gorgeous picture. And... And the reason why I picked this is because I felt this was a great argument for vertical photo taking. Oh, I was just going to say that I wish that he had done it landscape. No, but I think the verticality of the trees really lends itself to a vertical photo. And that's why sometimes a vertical picture is better. Uh, you're and never, I think the you're framing of this is so good. I think the framing of this is so good. The bottom third has the river. Then you get the middle third with the trees. Top third is the sky. It's great photography. This is I'm not going to argue that that's not a great picture, and I'm really pleased that he sent it in, but Team Landscape. Andrew. Till I die. High fives for me. I say team landscape. landscape unless you can get a better, more beautiful, uh, ratioed picture, and that was one All right. of these cases. It's a, it's a lovely picture, and you can yes. have your picture on our show as our photographer. All you have to do is send it to tomorrow at CNET.com. Yes, and uh, make sure you do these great things. Tell us how to pronounce your name if it's a difficult name, which... Most names are for us. Assume we're not bright, is what we're saying. And just <laughs> I think they already tell do. Us, yeah, just say, tell us just how to pronounce your name. Uh, secondly, give us permission to use your picture on the show, because we need that. Uh, also, tell us a nice little story about your picture, even if you made it up. We just like stories. It could be fiction. We're not, we're not saying it has to be true. Uh, and then the last one is, of course, tell us what device you took it on because it is phone photographer of the day and we want to know what phone you took it on. Four little things you got to do. Uh, also, uh, next month's theme we decided is spring. Spring. So uh, any springy pictures you want to spring on us, we'd appreciate it. Yeah, and it, uh, interestingly enough, Yanni wrote an email to us and had said... Yanni? Like, ye, ye Yanni. Not uh, Yanni live at the Acropolis. That would be amazing Yanni. if Yanni was like... Guys, you have no idea who we're talking about, and that's okay. Um, <laughs> I once went uh, to Halloween as Yanni. Wow. Yeah, I, it was can you bring amazing... that picture next week? I will, actually. Amazing. Yeah. Okay, I'm really looking forward to that. Guys, look up who Yanni is, and then <laughs> and you'll be ready for that picture. Yeah. Um, did you have a glorious mustache? I did. I did have a glorious mustache. I had long hair and a vest that had, like, harps and guitars all over it. It was amazing. I can't And I had a this. real open shirt, like, open white oh, yeah, billowy shirt. Oh, yeah, of course. You have to, because that is the Yanni. look. Yanni. Uh, our, our viewer, Yanni, mm. wrote in and said, why don't you do, like, like blooms or flowers? And so he says, oh, everything's nice. in bloom where I am. And so, spring. and I said, congratulations. We actually picked exactly that thing. It's spring. So send us your favorite pictures of blooming flowers and all of those other great things. Or, you know, a, a slinky. That's a, kind of a spring. Hey, hey, yo. Springs. Uh, your whatever creativity you want. will be appreciated. Yes. That's all we're saying. That is it for today's show. We will be back next week. I think you're going to be out for the first couple days next yep. week. Um, but beyond that, we will be back with uh, future tech, science fiction, science fact, all the great stuff that you like from, from us. Indeed. But until then. Be good humans. Bye, guys.